the whole campaign that the Biden administration is that the Biden campaign will run is about fear. Yeah. It's not going to be about the fear of Hamas, the fear of Palestinians, although they will say we kept Israelis safe from Hamas by giving 14,000 tank shells on a fast track without congressional approval to Israel. They'll say that, but the real fear is of the bad orange Hitler at home, uh, Trump. And that's what Kamala was on the view to spread. And it, again, not really the most convincing performance. Um, many say that one of your many strengths as a surrogate is your connection to young people. I believe that to be true. Mm -hmm. Now, voters between. No one said that. Like, no one said that Kamala has a connection to young people. I've never heard that before. That's a new talking point they're going with. But, like, who are the young people that she has a connection with at this point? Like young APAC leagues on, on college campuses? Like, I don't know. I mean, she appears at a lot of uh, HBCs at historically black colleges, and maybe she gets the sense that she has a connection with people there, but I don't really see that. Between 18 and 29 years old stand out as disapproving of the way the Biden administration is handling the Israel Hamas war. Um, they do not support sending weapons and money to Israel. They are advocating for a humanitarian ceasefire. Um, how does the administration respond to the concerns of this very important part of the Democratic voter base? So let's start with this. Um, and you're right, Sonny. In fact, uh, in the fall, I embarked on what I called a, a college tour and met with over 15,000 students um, across the country. Um, I, I just have to say, I love Gen Z, by the way. I, I think it's a spectacular generation. Oh, man. And, but all of that to say, you're absolutely Nobody right. believes that. I have talked with young people, many around the country, and I've heard them, I see them, and I understand. I understand. Um, but I think it's important that while we understand where they're coming from, which I do, that we not lose sight of the context, which is, let's just go back to October 7th. What? We can't deny the significance of a vicious, brutal attack that caused the death of 1,200 innocent people, a lot of them young people who are just attending a concert. Yeah. Women who are brutally assaulted and raped. And again, as someone who spent a lot of my career focused on those kinds of crimes, the horror. What? Of it. Mm -hmm. And invoking her legacy as a prosecutor to uh, try to add resonance to the unproven and factually challenged claim that there was rape, uh, which we challenged on a mass scale. On a mass scale. I mean, uh, it's you can this is how desperate she is to come up with a talking point all of that to also then say israel has a right to defend itself we would and how it does matters there have been far too many innocent palestinians that have been killed the president and I and many members of our administration have been very clear. I've been over, on over, I think, 14, 15 calls that the president has had with Bibi Netanyahu. Oh, no wonder it's going so well. What Israel must do to That's protect a scandal. innocent civilians. Um, we all want this to end as soon as possible. And how it ends matters. <laughs> That's a talking point. How it ends matters. Yeah. In other words, yeah. it has to end with the complete decimation of Gaza. Um, well, she's been a tool for the Israel lobby ever since she entered politics in a very robotic fashion. It's not like Cory Booker, where you can see there's an element of like him really enjoying his role. Like she's, he's like she's channeling MLK and the whole Baptist tradition in support of apartheid. And he really kind of enjoys it. She's just a robot. Um, she was fed these talking points and she is going over the heads again of Gen Z. She's, I like Gen Z. Gen Z is good. <laughs> I mean, no one can seriously say from her generation that they like Gen Z. They all hate Gen Z. They all think they're just freaks who can't like speak consecutive sentences, who are just stuck on screens all day. 
The only thing they say to Gen Z is they yell at them to get off their screens and uh, they don't understand them. They don't even understand. They speak a totally different language. And then she's just like, this is for the donor class. The Gen Z needs to recognize October 7th. And they speak about October 7th the same way they speak about January 6th. And the, but except October 7th didn't happen in America. That's not our country. In some ways they talk about it with more indignation than January 6th. Maybe because like the only people killed on January 6th were on the Trumper side. But uh, it's amazing how they're it, trying yeah. to actually push back. They're actually just, they're actually going there. They're actually trying to push back on their own base as the election runs around, comes around. I never see the Republicans do that. Like, do you think George W. Bush in 2004, when he campaigned, first of all, on continuing the Iraq war, but ultimately campaigned on preventing two guys from getting married <laughs> who love each other? Like, yeah. that's ultimately what his campaign was about. Do you yeah. think George Bush had a real, like, he, he was really homophobic? Do you think he really disliked being around gay people? Like, his chief of staff, Ken Melman, was gay. Mm -hmm. Everyone knew it. He yeah. didn't have any problem with gay people. He was just going to give his base whatever red meat they wanted because that's what Republicans do because they want to win. These people are so accountable to the Haim Sabans and the billionaire Zionist class of donors that have taken control of the Democratic Party elite that they just could care less about yeah. their base. I mean, look at this poll coming out of Michigan. This is amazing. And it's it's gonna it's gonna intensify. Jill Stein is polling at six percent. Hmm. Biden is getting destroyed by Donald Trump when you incorporate the third party candidates. Um, and 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 then you put like no labels in there. Liz Cheney. I mean, I don't know who would vote for Liz Cheney. That's crazy. But they're like people who I guess independent voters who don't want Trump or Biden. You can assume the Jill Stein voters have much higher political levels of political education or on the left or are Arab and must and or Muslim. And they're infuriated by what Biden is doing in Gaza. But Biden's getting destroyed by Trump there. And here's the view. This is the view of three quarters of committed voters, people who are likely to vote on Biden. 17% believe Biden deserves re-election. Only 17% of Michigan voters believe that in a key swing state. And 77% believe someone else should be running for president. They want him replaced. I think a majority of Democrats want Biden replaced. You know, going back to Kamala for a second, when she talks about, you know, she tries to place it all in the context of October 7th as if, history begins on October 7th. And it, it's interesting, like when any of us try to talk about what happened before October 7th, we get called all kinds of names, but it's like to understand events, you have to have context. Now she's trying to pretend as if the context is only October 7th and not the decades of occupation and ethnic cleansing that precede it, including, you know, just the, the months before October 7th and when Israel killed hundreds of Palestinians, uh, continued its pogroms in the West Bank, continued of course the strangulation of gaza so it's just interesting it's like they the only context they can give they can offer the comic can offer relies on this false premise that all of a sudden hamas woke up one day on october 7th and decided to go kill jews for you know because they hate jews and not because they were under a vicious decades-long occupation <laughs> which you just can't discuss in places like the view well, or, or, or yeah, anywhere in mainstream American political culture, the only questions people like us are allowed to ask are questions for which the answer produces a display of obedience to the official narrative. Do you condemn Hamas? That's going to be the first question. That's what Jeremy Corbyn got from Pierce Morgan again and again. Do you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn? Because there's only one answer. You're not allowed to say, uh, well, let's place this in context and look at history. And then they're like, you're contextualizing ISIS and beheadings and mass rape and genocide. You're not allowed to, to uh, provide context. Well, let me show you an example of that. I don't know if you saw this, Max, but an anchor on Channel 4 News of the UK 
politely tried to provide a little context. And then he was speaking to an Israeli spokesperson. Well, this is like, sorry. And it's important who this is. This is Elon Levy. He's the like millennial spokesman for Netanyahu who went to Oxford University. Born and, in the UK, I believe. He's not even yeah. born in Israel. Like He's all the Israeli spokespeople. Yeah. He's indigenous. Occasional misdemeanors. We're talking about more than 23, 24,000 people killed. Krishnan, that, the, that's, the civilian casualties. That's an extraordinary number of civilian casualties. And it's tragic. And it's tragic. Krishnan, it, everyone who has been killed since October 7th would still be alive if Hamas had not declared war. If Hamas were not fighting this war from densely populated areas, and no one else would be hurt yes, but this if didn't Hamas start surrendered October 7th and laid down their its terms, arms. Did it? Right. You know, you, you, can, you can say this would not have happened had October the 7th not happened. They would say October the 7th wouldn't have happened had Israel not occupied Gaza in the first place. I would be very wary of trying in any way to contextualize the atrocities of October 7th. I'm explaining the what they say. I'm not contextualizing. I'm saying I'm not. Why not? Occasional misdemeanors. Exactly. We're talking about more than 23, yeah, the, 24,000. The anchor is... The anchor's the anchor's only mistake there is backing down when he got threatened because yes you were contextualizing and it's fair to do that because unless you want to pretend as if history believe, uh, begins on October seventh if it doesn't then it's totally fair to provide context for it and he got threatened and so he immediately backed down and said I'm not contextualizing yes you are and it's fine to do that because facts matter history matters and again there was ample reasons there are ample ways Israel could have avoided uh, October seventh beginning with ending the occupation. It's it's like um, when nine eleven took place. This narrative took hold that nine eleven changed everything, and that's why we were supposed to give up our civil liberties. Yeah, just turn off our brains. Yeah, it's a very American narrative. I mean, America, American political culture is not as influenced as much by history, and Americans just ha ha and they are more infected with historical amnesia than other people people in Europe, uh, people in Latin America, or the Middle East, anywhere else in the world. I mean, if you just go to, I don't know, go to Bolivia, go to, um, go to Chile, go to any Eastern European country and talk to the average person about the news and or history, and they're all going to have a perspective on things. Americans just don't tend to be like that and it's de de-educated de as a process as the part of the process the post 1960s process of de-education uh there's actually a blueprint for that that was written by samuel huntington the crisis of democracy which urges uh you know it, it puts forward various recommendations to prevent democracy from running amok as it supposedly did in the 1960s and one of the things that i think holds us back prevents a real democratic culture is the constant psyoping of the american public through various shocks that are now associated with dates january 6 october 7th 9 11 uh then russia gate worse than pearl harbor worse than uh the holocaust the worst killing most killing of worst killing of jews since the holocaust and all other history has to be off the table. It's to, it's not only designed to make us anxious and make us respond in an irrational, emotional way. It's designed to make us. Um, it's designed to make us afraid of history. Like, mm -hmm. don't look at that book. Don't read that. That's disinformation. Uh, conspiracy theory. That's a conspiracy theory. And that's actually what Tony Blinken said. We're getting a little far afield from the U.S. election. But, uh, it's okay. do I but do I have this? Yeah, I have this clip finally of Tony Blinken back at Davos. And I wanted to play this earlier because basically Tony Blinken is calling us uh, conspiracy theorists. And you can see the way he distorts it and abuses October 7th. I can just get some. I want to give you a chance to respond to that. No. Period. Okay, so he says no. Um, There's no fast forward on Instagram, but for me, I think for so many of us, we already uh, ran through what this. We're seeing every single day in Gaza, uh, it's gut wrenching. 
Um, and the suffering we're seeing among innocent men, women, and children breaks my heart. The question is, what is to be done? Israelis have to live with security. They can't have a repeat of October 7th. No country would accept a repeat of October 7th. And I think not by way of justification, but just by way of explanation. Uh, it's hard to overstate the psychological impact on the country as a whole of what happened on that day. Information technology, Here it is. information environments have been used and abused in such a way that large numbers of people don't believe October 7th actually happened. They don't believe that Hamas slaughtered men, women, and children, that it executed parents in front of their kids, that it executed kids in front of their parents, that it burned families alive. So, so there it is. I mean, he's blaming information technology for convincing people that October 7th never happened. It's the classic straw man approach where you fault critics of your policy for positions they don't actually hold, right? Like there's no uh, strain of Palestinian solidarity that denies October 7th happened. Uh, you know, maybe like that's in some chat room somewhere. Someone believes that. But um, the only you know, question is who was responsible for some of the killings? We know Hamas obviously killed civilians or uh, Hamas and other militants killed civilians. But the question is how many of its own people did Israel kill? Uh, and that question has been raised not just by us uh, and the electronic intifada and other places, but by Israeli media as well, uh, where there's increasing calls for accountability for the execution of the Hannibal Directive in, in and whether how many people Israeli forces killed, for which is, there's already evidence and testimony for. So he's straw manning the counter argument uh, because yep. he can't actually challenge it, which is a typical tactic we often face uh, from anybody who doesn't actually want to take up the things we actually say, but just wants to disparage us. But it's, 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 it's in a way, it's great to see him saying this at Davos because it means we've gotten to him. The alternative independent press has gotten to Tony Blinken and we nailed Tony Blinken. He lied on October 31st when he appeared before the Senate. Yep. And concocted a atrocity you know he performed atrocity exhibition based on the bogus testimony of yossi landau of the discredited israeli so-called rescue organization zaka and we nailed him on that like what he described never took place there was no evidence for it and so he's making more general allusions to atrocities that are harder to debunk but you know they burned entire families alive and what people are frustrated and upset about is the exaggeration of the atrocities and killings that took on, that took place on October 7th in order to pave way psychologically and politically for Israel's genocidal rampage, which made anything that happened on October 7th pale in comparison in which Tony Blinken's supporting. So he's doing that again, but he's frustrated because nobody believes him, which is great because he is a spreader of disinformation and he's advancing a call for censorship at Davos, a place where the censorship industrial complex gets together to not only complain about the lack of trust in officialdom, mainly because of the pandemic, because they all just lied and lied and lied and played games with average people, working class people around the world, um, after they gamed out the pandemic response. And now they're talking about disease X. That's pretty troubling. So why would anyone trust them? But nobody trusts Tony Blinken or believes him because they lied in order to commit genocide. Um, so anyway, that's... Yeah, and that's, and that's why, Max, why we're seeing now puff pieces in places like the New York Times to try to uh, salvage the reputation of Zaka, this great point. main source for Blinken's fake claims uh, and you've written at the gray zone about just all the problems not just with Zaka's claims which have shown to be false and Israeli media has admitted that too but also with just what a scandal uh, played organization they are including a founder who was accused of uh, sex crimes um, and so that's why the New York Times came out with this puff piece about Zaka and trying to basically whitewash the fact that they uh, destroyed evidence uh, during their response to October 7th uh, and don't have any forensic evidence to offer for these claims of rape uh, because that evidence so far does not exist. And this article even contains, you know, 
an oblique reference to us, I think. It says activists have yeah. cast doubt on the rape claims and also, again, totally straw mans the reason uh, why we've questioned them. Um, it says um, that uh, some activists seeking to deny that militants raped and mutilated victims on October 7th have said Zaka's volunteers' testimony is unreliable because the men are not medical experts or police officers trained in investigating sex crimes. Again, it's also a straw man. They're not credible, first of all, because they've been caught lying. Yeah. <laughs> they've been caught lying. Um, and then that's why in the next actually sentence, actually, they, they, they admit that. They say some Zaka members have given misleading accounts to the news media. Uh, and some imposters posing as volunteers have given false information in the group's name. So is this the New York Times new excuse now for the fact that Zaka was caught lying? The people who were caught lying actually are imposters? who are posing as members of Zaka in some kind of conspiracy to like undermine Zaka's credibility. Israeli media is more honest than the New York Times because Israeli media has pointed out that these people lied, that they gave false claims about dozens of beheaded babies and other other uh, atrocity claims that turned out to be false. Um, the fetus cut out of a pregnant woman. Exactly, um, exactly. So that's why know, we're seeing damage control in the New York Times. And and who are the, who are the imposters? The, who are the people who are not part of Zaka who are lying. We don't know who they are. Yeah. Activists are challenging it. We don't know who the activists are. They don't this is like the exactly. worst kind of sleazy reporting. But Aaron, by bringing up that piece, you reminded me of something. Um, anyone who's watched, watches the gray zone, our streams regularly, you probably s saw or know about where we called Liza DeVoskin, the Washington Post's social media reporter, who, by the way, is the counterpart of that New York Times reporter who did the Zaka piece, uh, Shira Frankel. She's the San Francisco-based social media reporter. So uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't be shocked if they know each other. But when Liza DeVoskin approached us, she basically accused us of minimizing October 7th atrocities. When she approached Electronic Intifada, and this is public, uh, Ali Abunima tweeted about it, she used this almost the I language identical to Tony Blinken at Davos, where she accused them of implanting some kind of conspiracy theory in the minds of the public that October 7th didn't happen, which leads me to believe that her interest in us and EI was actually triggered by something like the State Department's Global Engagement Center, which suppose, which tracks supposed disinformation and plays a huge role. It's a hub of the censorship industrial complex. And they were looking for friendly main, major legacy media to do a hit piece to try to push back because what Blinken was trying to do wasn't working because we were so disruptive. Um, that's my conspiracy theory based on my, uh, I think a pretty good analysis now of the language that Blinken and the Washington Post reporter used and how similar it was. And where is that piece, by the way, Aaron? I mean, well, I think it's uh, DOA because um, in our phone call, we challenged her to substantiate her claims about us and the electronic intifada and like her sleazy attempts to say we're minimizing atrocities. Of course, she couldn't offer anything. She hasn't offered anything since. And, um, and since that art, since all that happened when we called her, that was two weeks ago today. Um, more has come out in the Israeli media about how Israel, you know, implemented the Hannibal Directive on October seventh and killed its own people, fired on vehicles carrying hostages that were going to Gaza and likely killing people there. And so, when you have even Israeli media confirming all the reporting we've done about October seventh. I think they realize they just have absolutely even with even with how uh, how effective they are or, or, or how much work they put into disingenuous language to smear dissent. They don't have anything to go on, and so I, I think that story is dead. Yeah, I saw her. She had she really hadn't tweeted since the phone call, and then she just did a story on something else. So looks like we killed a Washington Post story. We killed it with facts. <laughs> Yeah. And the facts are just the preponderance of facts about the Hannibal Directive are so extreme that Haaretz interviewed the Israeli army's longtime, quote unquote, ethicist, Asa Kasher, who has had a job at, tel been a professor at Tel Aviv University. He helped conceive the neighbor policy that's being used in Gaza, where the Israeli army is allowed to <clears throat> 
kill the terrorists, non-dangerous neighbor in his words to basically kill civilians in order to get to Hamas operatives. This is the, the, so this is the philosopher of death. And he told Haaretz that he found the Hannibal directive execution on October 7th to be horrific uh, and completely out of bounds and shocking, obviously, because Jewish lives are concerned. But I mean, it's become a scandal in mainstream Israeli society, as has the fact that uh, Israel appears to be using the Hannibal directive continuously after October 7th to kill the hostages in Gaza. As we reported at the Gray Zone.